Hi, welcome to part one, the student boarding context. There are six parts in boarding fundamentals and this is the first part. The assessment is a scenario. A person has contacted you because they're considering applying for a boarding supervisor position at your residence. They know very little about boarding or your residence, so they've sent you some questions below and they're meeting with you for an hour next week. So just make dot points under these questions when you're referring to the notes or to this video. And you can see the sort of questions here, explain about the current boarding scene in Australia and support associations, etc. Okay, so introduction to boarding. The earliest boarding facilities were probably monasteries and the oldest known boarding school and in the in a, still operating is King's School in Canterbury, which started about 600 AD. And you can see some images here of King's School in Canterbury. In Australia, uh, the first boarding school was King's School in Parramatta in 1831. There were actually two King's Schools. One was in Sydney, one was in Parramatta. Um, and with the Sydney school, the principal died in the first year and the school closed, never reopened. The annual fee for boarding and tuition was £28 and only very wealthy families would send their boys to boarding schools. Girls didn't attend in those days. It was a boys boarding school. In the 1830s, the government provided money for schools, teachers, books, and there was a uniform curriculum right across Australia. Um, and in the 1870s, attendance became compulsory at schools in Australia. Um, that was very hard to police, and Indigenous students were actually locked out of that. Um, so it wasn't very successful. Boarding numbers in Australia peaked in the early 1990s, about 30,000 students. And so these were from the traditional places, so rural areas or remote areas where students found it hard to access education. But farming practices in Australia and all over the world changed and you know farms grew very large and people disappeared off the land and so uh, the numbers in boarding fell. The global financial crisis in 2008 stripped a lot of parents of wealth and so the numbers fell right down to about 20,000 boarding students. But numbers have been increasing recently and it's back up to around 28,000 students. In Australia, there's about 239 boarding programs and this changes as boarding programs close or new boarding programs open. About 189 of these are traditional boarding schools and 50 are boarding residences and they range in size from about 10 students to 800 students. The largest is Geelong Grammar on several different sites, but they've got about 800 boarders. And the oldest of these, as we already said, is Parramatta King School, um, which opened in 1831. In Australia, the governments, state and Commonwealth governments, operate boarding schools. And so in Western Australia, they operate five agricultural college and nine residential colleges, Queensland, they operate residential colleges at Dolby, Mount Isa and Weeper, New South Wales, there's agricultural colleges, there's a Wiltshire residential program for Indigenous students in South Australia, and there's Northern Territory operating boarding residences at Catherine and Nullumboy. Aboriginal hostels um, own and operate nine hostels around Australia. So we consider why parents actually send their children to boarding school. The traditional reasons are for educational and other opportunities or that the parents are actually living in areas with, with limited access to schools. But there's lots of other reasons. And um, sometimes parents have got a history with a boarding school. They think their students will have a greater advantage. They, they seek a structured environment with allocated sport times and study times so that the student has got a very structured environment. And for a lot of parents with their complex lifestyles, they can't provide that sort of structure during the week, so they'll have their, their, their students in boarding during the week and then they'll come home on the weekends. Some parents put their students in boarding because they want to remove them from negative influences. Um, uh, you know, they might feel that there's other students who are impacting their students negatively. Um, and sometimes they put them in boarding to access special educational opportunities. So that might be for music or for art, or it might be something like a school for the deaf or something of that type. The most common types of student boarding programs are either traditional boarding schools, which combines a school program and a boarding program, or 
a boarding residence or a hostel, which is a boarding program without a school. And within those two main models, there's variation such as the traditional boarding residence, family group homes and homestays. Now, a family group home is a, a traditional type home where you might have a husband and wife or, or a, um, a, a single house parent or a couple of house parents and they look after a group in a home and it might be eight or ten students in a home and um, you know there are some examples of that in the Northern Territory particularly here and also uh, there's a lot of uh, examples of it in the overseas international boarding context. Homestays are where a boarder will just stay with a family in their home and um, uh, and participate in the activities in that home. There are other types of student accommodation in Australia and the biggest of these is out of home care uh, and we also have asylum seeker care although that uh, these days is um, you know is very small. With the out of home care that's either resident this is for children who um, have been taken from their parents who are not with their parents anymore for a range of different reasons and they're either in res residential care in you know residences in family group type homes or in home-based foster care most of these um, young people are in foster care you can see here on this table um, that there's about 43,000 young people who are in home care that means that they're not with their parents but in the care of the state and you can see the breakdown state by state. It's a lot of it's a lot of young people, and um, it's a it's a growing area, sadly. Indigenous boarding programs. This is a significant and consistently growing area in boarding in Australia. There was a lot of growth in the 1970s and 1980s, and this was because um, Aboriginal people moved from urban centres back to their traditional communities, and uh, when they went back to their traditional communities, some of some of the communities are quite small. You know, there might have only been say twenty or thirty young people in a school, and so often they would send their young people away to boarding schools so that they could access, you know, the, the range of different opportunities that were available. The Wilson Review came out in the Northern Territory and it found that literacy and numeracy outcomes of remote Indigenous students were well below non-Indigenous students and they were also below Indigenous students who were not in remote communities. So, so um, the literacy and numeracy outcomes of these remote students were quite low. Wilson also found that it was difficult to offer viable quality secondary education program in small remote communities and that's logical, of course. I mean, if you've got, you know, 12 or 15 or 20 high school students, how can you offer them the range of options that are available to all other students? And so he recommended residential programs in urban centres for these young people. So Indigenous boarding or boarding can offer this to Indigenous young people. Consistent attendance variety of choice of options and electives that sort of thing equal quality of education to Australian other Australian young people more work experience more career choice uh, it's a social experience they have access to standard Australian English there are good health and well-being outcomes uh, security support for young people and positive adult and peer role models when we look at indigenous boarding there are four different types in Australia boarding schools, boarding residences, small groups in traditional boarding schools and transitional boarding programs. So the first of these are boarding schools that cater primarily for Indigenous students and in the Northern Territory they're, um, they're boarding schools like Urara, Haleberry, St John's, Marara, Tiwi um, and they uh, cater primarily for Indigenous students and you can see the ones in the other states as well. Then we have boarding residences that cater for Indigenous students. So these are residences without a school. Um, and some of these are operated by state governments, like Broome Residential College, Western Cape um, Campus. Some are operated by uh, AHL, Aboriginal Hostels Limited. Some are set up by com Aboriginal communities themselves, like Jibi Jibi at Jabiru. And the Woonan Corporation have got boarding facilities in Melbourne, Sydney and Perth. And then you'll have sporting organisations that set up these boarding residences as well. 
and so you've got Cowboys NRL House and AFL Cape York House, um, and then you've got the Commonwealth Government running um, boarding programs in Aboriginal communities at Wadir and Nullumboy. So that's the second type. So we had boarding schools, then boarding residences, and now we've got a small cohort of Indigenous students in a traditional boarding school. So approximately 55 schools in seven states and territories have got small groups um, uh, from you know anywhere from two students to 80 students um, in their um, residence and and so this averages out about 20 students so um, you know a school you know a traditional boarding school in the city they will make these opportunities available for young people and then they'll bring in a cohort of young people often on scholarships and the scholarships come from Australian Indigenous Education Foundation which is the largest of these or organizations like Yulari. So this is the third model and the fourth model is transition programs where students are intensively supported for a year or more and then they transition from that into other boarding schools and the, um, the one the, the most common of these is MITS, uh, the one that um, uh, has been established in Melbourne. It stands for Melbourne Indigenous Transition School. It's got about 24 students and they're there for a year and then they transition out of there into other boarding facilities in the area. It's a good model and um, we're thinking that we're going to see more of these in the future. In Australia, there's a, there's a developing organisation called the Remote Indigenous Parents Association, or RIPA, and that is it was started in 19, sorry, 2015, and it's um, developing as we speak. The changing expectation of boarding. Um, so boarding used to just be a safe place for students to, to sleep, have meals, go to school, Boarding staff just monitored students to keep them from injury and misbehaviour. They organised homework, that sort of thing. But today, that's very different. There's a changed expectation. Today, the programs are very carefully structured and managed. Staff are well trained. It's a much more homely sort of environment. And it's very holistic development, physical, academic, social, emotional and spiritual. Um, the individual needs of the students are catered for and it is a place of significant learning and development um, and you can see that from an example here the, the Wesley School in Melbourne and they actually call their boarding program learning in residence and so um, the, the expectations of parents and other people in the community of boarding have changed and they're very different you can also see this from residence building design so the traditional design, you can see that image on the left-hand side, very institutional, to buildings that are very homely and comfortable. So in the past, you had large dormitories, um, you know, large ablution areas, study and homework areas in halls or classrooms, large recreation areas, etc. So you can see some images there and here. You probably recognise that image. Um, and... Buildings in the past were substantial buildings, so some of them were very beautiful buildings on the outside, but the, in, the interiors were institutional and lacked the comfort and warmth of home. Um, sometimes they were also found space, which means that a building was utilised, which was actually designed for a bit different purpose, but it was made into um, a boarding residence, so we call that found space. Today, the focus is on homely and comfortable um, to cater for all the individual needs. This is a uh, boarding residence in Thailand. Um, features include smaller residences with their own identities, um, one or two students to a bedroom, shared bathroom or an ensuite, individual study areas in each bedroom, a number of small recreation areas, recreation options like gyms, swimming pools, theatres, um, smaller dining areas and table settings, comfortable contemporary furniture, contemporary comfortable floor covering. So sometimes you walk into these buildings and it's just like walking into a family home. They're very homely um, and they're not the very large dormitory type things of the past. So the focus is going to, you know, with buildings is different for different stakeholders. So students and parents want something that's attractive, comfortable, secure, 
organizations they want the same but they also want um, you know things buildings that are cost effective um, you know with the utilities uh, cleaning and maintenance that sort of thing so they, they are looking for buildings to be cost effective boarding supervisors want things like open sight lines limited hidden spaces ease of supervision they also of course want um, buildings to be comfortable and safe there's a couple of examples of uh, the new approach to buildings. I'll put images in here from Rodine in England and also from Wesley College. Um, and if we're talking about sight lines, supervision's much simpler and much more effective if supervisors can see large expanses of area at the one time, if there are few hidden areas. So if there's lots of obstructions, then supervision is more difficult. This is an image of Wesley a boarding program in Melbourne. And you can see the very open sight lines. And so when you're looking at that, the students will either, you know, pretty much be out there where you can see them or inside the buildings. You know, there's, they're not, you know, hidden behind the buildings, that sort of thing. So buildings are changing. There's an image of Scott's in Adelaide. This is inside uh, a dormitory in um, a residence in Thailand. And I've taken this from a newspaper and it says luxury hotel or boarding school dorm and so boarding school accommodation is looking decidedly stylish and this is a Rodine um, they, they recently had some refurbishment but it does look very nice the other thing of course is that in England um, it's uh, common practice to use the boarding residences during the holidays for organizations um, to rent the buildings out and so they need them to look nice this is my favorite picture I guess of these there's a boarding residence on the coast in England. You can see the sea outside the window. Um, just very comfortable, very nice, um, very homely. So we want to move from this to look at um, closed security, closed circuit security cameras. Um, these can make super <coughs> supervision more effective, but they must be managed carefully. Some organisations only have them on the outside of buildings. Others have them in common areas. A lot of advantages for these. Um, it's, you know, the effective monitoring of students, quickly identifying unwanted students, uh, sorry, visitors, evidence of correct medication procedures. So, so um, supervisors will, you know, provide the medication to a student in front of a video camera so they have that evidence. Um, it's evidence if supervisors are accused of violating a boundary. So, you know, they can go back and, and look at the video and say, no, they didn't or, or, or maybe they did. Um, observing remote areas, assisting in emergency evacuation, deterring crime and vandalism. The disadvantages, of course, are that students sometimes feel privacy is compromised. Um, supervisors may remain in front of a video screen and supervision by a security camera is a very poor alternative to personal interaction with students. If you're going to use them, you need to have very carefully developed policies about who's going to watch them, um, all of that sort of thing. You need good signage in residences, all the required signs like exits, evacuations, that sort of thing. Um, and these signs need to be explained during student induction. Students need secure storage, so they should at have one place at least which is secure, maybe a locker or a lock lockable drawer or a small safe. There also needs to be uh, secure storage for medicines and dangerous goods. In Australia, there's two support associations for boarding. There is Boarding Australia, and the Boarding Australia group tend to look after uh, not the traditional boarding schools, but all of the other uh, types of boarding. ABSA, Australian Boarding Schools Association, they tend to look after or support traditional boarding schools. So let's look at international boarding. Um, some countries have a, a boarding school culture such as uh, UK, India, Australia, other countries such as USA and Canada, they still have boarding, but it's not as strong. And here's some numbers um, about international boarding, where the boarding schools are. And you can see China has 100,000 boarding schools. We're going to explain that in a moment. Um, and you can see the different um, countries and the numbers in each. It's hard to get very accurate figures but um, this is roughly how many are in these countries. In China, 
um, when the one child policy came in, 250,000 schools were closed because they, were ju they just became too small because there were a lot less children in these you know, rural villages. And so they opened 100,000 um, rural boarding schools for 33 million students and 51% of secondary students and 11% of primary students are in these boarding schools in Western China. Um, kindergarten boarding schools are also available for wealthy parents in China. In, in UK, there's been strong, consistent growth in boarding, even after something like the GFC. So there's 770 boarding schools or 68,000 boarders. And you can see the breakdown there between full boarders, weekly boarders and flexi boarders. Over 400 boarding schools except primary age students. In Switzerland, it's a business. Um, and there's some very large boarding schools in Switzerland. Eight out of the most expensive boarding schools in the world are in Switzerland, and you can have fees as high as 140,000 Australian dollars per child per year. I think Global is an interesting boarding school. It moves each term, um, a new city each term. They do the international baccalaureate, nine countries over three years, and this year they're visiting Botswana, India, Japan, and Spain. The significant significant growth in Asia and Africa in international boarding and this is Branksome Hall in Asia um, and um, it's a very beautiful looking school and sometimes you'll have uh, local governments like the Chinese government who input into these because they want to see these uh, schools coming to their countries. Let's talk a little bit about context because the context which is the conditions or circumstances in which something takes place will affect practice so context determines practice. And um, when we look at uh, context, the policies and procedures are affected by a historical, social and political and economic context of the boarding residents. Um, so if we look at historical, this is any way in which past events or traditions affect the way things are done today. Economic, the way that the economic current economic climate um, or the way that you get fees uh, can affect your boarding practice. And then the social context. This is the immediate physical and social setting of the residents and this will also um, affect your practice. So context, your context, your different contexts will affect your boarding practice. We want to look at um, primary age boarding. What age should students commence boarding? Is it in the best interest of a young person to commence boarding while in primary school? Bearing in mind the first, my first boarding experience was in a house of 40 primary age students, anywhere from year three right up to year seven. Um, countries like um, New Zealand have a strong primary age boarding tradition, as does the UK. We just looked at um, their statistics. I've got 400 boarding residents that take students from primary age. In um, the UK, you have these campaigns um, to stop um, young children going to boarding schools. Um, and um, you can see one here. Um, and they refer to the United Nations um, rights of the child and that sort of thing. John le Carre said this, he said, the British are known to be mad, but in the maiming of their pr privileged young, they're criminally insane. What he's saying is, um, you know, that they shouldn't be sending primary aged children to boarding schools. And this image is a boys boarding school in New Zealand. And it's, um, it's rather different to go in and see teddy bears on their beds because these are primary age students. Bear Grylls was a primary age student. He's written this book, very interesting book, and recommend that you read it. A couple of interesting things from it is that he was bullied as a child uh, in, in boarding school, and because of that, he developed these strategies and became the, the kind of person that he is today with all of those different skills. The other thing he says in this is the huge impact that the boarding house parents, house masters, had on his life and how much they meant to him and um, you know how instrumental they were in helping him become the person he is. So thank you very much. That's the end of this first part.